Amen. I'm glad to be saved, ain't you? Hallelujah. I got in on preaching. I don't know about you. Thank God for preaching. I like singing. But nothing takes the place of preaching. Thank God. It's a good place to be. My, what a service today. I'm telling you. I, I thought we was just going on to glory this afternoon, brother. It was good. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Take, it, take the word of God and turn with me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 14 tonight. Proverbs chapter number 14. You pray for us. I'm nervous as a tick tonight. Proverbs chapter number 14. And... Uh, Beginning in verse number 14, I want to share a verse with you. Keep your Bible open. We're going to go to 1 Samuel 15 in just a moment. But I want to share a springboard text here with you out of Proverbs 14, one verse of Scripture, and that is verse number 14. Proverbs 14, verse number 14. The Bible says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And a good man shall be satisfied from himself. A good man shall be satisfied from himself. If the Lord help me tonight, I want to preach on that subject, being satisfied from yourself. Father, thank you tonight for the precious word of God. Lord, how our hearts have rejoiced and our faith has been fortified and strengthened over everything that we've heard already since we've been here at this camp meeting. Thank you for Brother Morgan. Thank you for all the preachers that have stood here to preach and God, how they've exhorted and edified and challenged and strengthened our hearts. We thank you, God, for what you're gonna do even this evening, I pray. God, that you'd bless Brother Phil Beck as he comes in just a moment. God, bless the Love Valley Choir. I pray, God, that you'd just get on this place tonight. And I pray the Spirit of God would have liberty. God, give us unction and boldness to say the things that you have put in our hearts to say tonight. And God, we realize tonight, Lord, when you gave us this message just a couple of weeks ago, God, you birthed it in our heart. And Lord, let us know that it was for this meeting. And I thank you, God, that you are sovereign God who knows the needs of mankind. And Lord, no doubt, my heart was heavy. And God, there's someone here tonight, God, who may be making decisions in their life that's going to it's going to destroy their entire marriage, their future, their children. Lord, there's a man standing in this place tonight that's been entertaining ideas of running around on his wife. Lord, there may be a woman here tonight that's been fantasizing about what it would be like to have a better husband. Lord, there may be a young person or a teenager here tonight. God, that's been waiting to the day they turn 18 years of age to get out from under mom and daddy's thumb to be able to do some things that's been in their hearts to do for quite some time. And I pray tonight, God, that you would protect them from themselves. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. We'll give you all the glory for it. God's people said, amen. You can be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure that any of us here tonight in this tabernacle understand exactly what extent God has gone to to protect us from ourselves. I don't know of anybody more dangerous to me than me. I don't know of anybody that could destroy me quicker than the man you're looking at tonight. I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, your greatest enemy is not the devil. I've got news for you. We have tried to deify the devil. We've tried to make him omnipresent, but the devil cannot be. Listen, he wasn't in your house all week last week and at your neighbor's house and it's a man at somebody else's house. He can't be everywhere at the same time. I'm, I'm convinced that a lot of what we give the devil the blame for and a lot of what we give him credit for is just the man or woman you look in the mirror every morning when you look in the mirror. If we'd be real honest about it, the devil don't have to spend a lot of time at my house and he don't have to spend a lot of time at your house. As long as we are there, we're doing a good enough job that the devil don't have to do a lot to try to hinder us and trip us up. But I want you to notice something about this text tonight in the book of Proverbs. A very interesting verse of scripture about a backslider. Now I want you to notice something about this backslider. He's not out at the bar. He's not at the tavern. Oh, she's not out committing a fornication and adultery. But notice where this backslider is. This backslider may be sitting 
sitting under this tabernacle tonight. He may be sitting in church. He's not backslidden in his actions. He's backslidden in his heart. The Bible says that the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Now I want you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, that the Bible says that a backslider is not satisfied. Listen to me. He is not satisfied with his own ways. He, he, the Bible says that he, a good man shall be satisfied from his own ways, but a backslider, he, the Bible says he seeketh to do his own ways. In other words, he said a backslider is not satisfied with his own ways, but when a man repents and gets right with God, he shall be satisfied from himself. He said a backslider, by the way, let me say something about your own way. I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you how you know when you're backslidden. It may not be that you're out of church. It may not be that you quit going soul winning. It may not be that you quit dressing right. It may be that you're still doing all the right things and you've been in this meeting all week, but ladies and gentlemen in your heart you've got your own ideas about what you want and what you think things should be and when a man or a woman is filled with his own ways he is backslidden in his heart and I'm going to tell you something tonight listen to me I'm going to tell you something when you get your way you are backslidden I'll tell you how I know when I'm backslidden or not I want my way when you, the Bible says a backslider and heart's filled with his own ways and your ways are not God's ways and then you'll never be more backslidden in your heart than when you get your way. But notice what the Bible says. He's not satisfied with that. A good man is satisfied from himself but a backslider wants what he wants. Jesus said this. He gave a, I understand salvation's a free gift tonight, but there are requirements for discipleship and there are decisions that we must make. And Jesus said, if any man follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The number one requirement to follow Jesus Christ is to deny what you want. To deny yourself. I'm going to tell you something, brother. I'm going to tell you why our churches are in a mess tonight. Because everybody wants it their way. Oh, there's a man over here that's upset because he's not getting his way. And she's upset because she's not getting her way. And let's just be honest. She may be faithful to church. She may sing in the choir. But she's backslidden in her heart. I'm going to tell you something, friend. You'll never be satisfied with yourself. You'll never get enough money that you're satisfied. You'll never get what you want and say, okay, now I'm satisfied. You'll never get, amen. I'm going to tell you something. You start seeking what you want, you will never be satisfied. When you want your way, when you get your way, you won't be happy and you won't be satisfied. A backslider is filled with his own ways and he's still not happy. He's still not happy. Still not satisfied. But notice what verse 14 says. But a man that repents and gets right with God, a good man shall be satisfied not with himself. I'll tell you something, I'm never, never satisfied with myself. But I'm gonna tell you something, brother. Thank God we can be satisfied from ourselves. I'm glad to know that God can satisfy us from ourselves. You see, as long as we're filled with our own ways, you'll find out the hard way that you will never be satisfied. Now, I want you to know something tonight. I'm here tonight on a mission. This preacher's on a mission tonight. And that mission is to protect you from yourself. I want you to know something, young person. Every time your man of God gets up in the pulpit, he's on a mission. And that's to protect you from yourself. Your greatest enemy is you. And that man is there for one reason, and that's to protect you from yourself. Now I want you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, in the word of God, what extent God has gone to to protect us from ourselves. Why are we seeing so many preachers fall? Why are we seeing so many young people wash out on God? Why is it that some folks that was in this meek last year are not here tonight? Why is it that me and we look up to and respect and good families in the churches are washing out on God? I'm gonna tell you why. Because this thing called self is destroying us. I'm talking about the flesh. 
Uh, I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 15. In 1 Samuel 15, we find a story I'm sure you're familiar with. And here is where, you know the story where Saul is the king of Israel. And God tells Saul through the prophet Samuel, I want you to go down to Amalek. And I want you to kill everything that moves. Everything that breathes. I want you to kill every man. I want you to kill every woman. I want you to kill every boy. I want you to kill every girl. I want you to kill every infant. I want you to kill every suckling. I want you to kill every ox. I want you to kill every ass. He said, if it has breath, I want it dead. Why did God speak with such severity about the Amalekites? Now, those of you that are familiar with the scriptures, you know who Amalek is. Amalek is the grandson of a man by the name of Esau. Esau in the Bible is a type of the flesh. Esau was a twin. You know there's two of you if you're saved tonight. Your greatest battle and your greatest struggle is not with the devil. Your greatest struggle is with your twin. And I'm going to tell you something about your twin called Esau. Amen. You listen good. He's the firstborn. And your first birth is rotten. Your first birth is flesh. And I'm going to tell you, there's been a struggle in the womb of between Jacob and Esau. And that struggle is still going on today between the spirit and the flesh. We're some mixed up people, preacher. When you got saved, amen. <laughs> You found out real quick that you're not the only you. I mean, brother, we've, you're talking about personality conflicts. You're talking about split personalities. Hey, Amen. I mean, you make up your mind you're going to go for God. You're going to do something for God. You've got to, hey, man, you've got to settle, man. I'm going to do this for God. And you'll be walking in victory one minute, shouting the big, hey, it feels good to be at camp meeting. But I'm telling you something. Monday's coming, friend, and Tuesday's coming. And some of us that are sitting here tonight shouting will be pouting when old Esau or Amalek rises up their head on Tuesday. Out of nowhere. You say, well, you have, you have to talk to yourself. You have conversations with you. Where'd that come from? What in the world was I thinking that for? And there's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. But I want you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, that God has told us how to protect us from us. God has shown us in his word, Brother Ladder, how we can be protected from our, not just be protected, but to be satisfied from ourselves. I want you to see something with me in the word of God. I want you to notice that God here in our text is trying to protect Saul from the Amalekites, a picture of the flesh. He's trying to protect him from the flesh. And notice what he says in verse number two. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, God said, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. I preached a message one time on that phrase, in the way. What keeps getting in the way? There was one enemy waiting on the Egyptians, uh, waiting on Israel when they came up out of Egypt. There was one enemy that stood between them and Canaan land, between them and victory. There's one thing that stands between you and walking in victory tonight, and that is that enemy called Amalek, the flesh. And notice what God said. Here's what I want you to do, Saul. I want you to go down to Amalek, and I want you to kill everything that looks like the flesh, everything that smells like the flesh, everything that breathes like the the flesh, every, everything that has the flesh's appearance, everything that belongs to the flesh, I want you to destroy it, I want you to kill it, I want you, amen, I want you to put it to death, and I'm going to tell you something, brother, there is a danger in letting anything of the flesh live. God said, I want you to kill those things that look dangerous, like those big grown Amalekite soldiers, and I want you to kill those things of the flesh that look that seem to be harmless and innocent, like a little baby, a little suckling. He said, I don't care if it's a little thing of the flesh, that thing's gonna grow. If you don't kill it while it's young and you don't stump it out while it's little, if you don't kill it while it's got breath and while you can get victory one day, that little baby Amalekite's gonna grow up on you. One day, that little thing of the flesh is gonna become a big thing of the flesh. And so notice, ladies and gentlemen, there's a great danger in letting in. You know what God commands us to do, preacher? God commands us to kill anything. Amen. We are to crucify the flesh. 
mortify the deeds of the body. We're to kill anything that's of the flesh. Crucified. If we let it live, Saul found out the hard way. Saul found out the hard way, ladies and gentlemen, that the very thing Saul let live is the very thing that took his life and the very thing that took his crown. You know who it was? Coming up to David with Saul's crown, it was the flesh. If you don't, listen to me, if you don't deal with the flesh, the flesh will deal with you. I want you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, notice the things that God had given Saul to protect him from himself. First of all, look in verse number two. God gave, listen to me, Saul had a message from God to protect him from the flesh. He said in verse two, thus saith the Lord of hosts. I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. And look at this, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman and infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. I want you to notice, God gave Saul a message and this was the message. God said, I want you to destroy everything in your life that pertains to Amalek. Everything of the flesh. I want you to kill it. I want you to crucify it. I want you to cut it down. I want you to stifle it out. I want you to drive it back. I want you to stomp on it. I want you to beat it out. Why? Because God said the very thing that you let get by and the very thing you let go and the very thing you seem to be harmless in your life will be the very thing that takes your spiritual life. God gave Saul a message to protect him from himself. But number two, God gave Saul a man to protect him from himself. Not only did he have a message from God, but he had a man of God. The Bible tells, notice the Bible says that God sent a man by the name of Samuel. And Samuel is the one that God sent to protect Saul from the Amalekites that would one day take his life. And I'm gonna tell you something, friend. Let me tell you something, young person. God didn't put a preacher in your life to make your life miserable. God didn't put your preacher in your life so that your life would be miserable and you couldn't do what you wanted to do. No, God put him in your life to keep you from yourself, to protect you from yourself. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the only hope you've got is that man of God standing in the pulpit thundering forth the word of life. The only hope you've got is a man to crowd against your flesh, crowd against the sins of your flesh. Well, I don't like a preacher that preaches on all those things. Come on, preacher. Preach. They're right. What you're saying is I want my own way. Yes. You know what he's preaching against? Your way. Yes. And any man, any woman, any teenager that don't want a man of God preaching against their sin wants their way. Yes. And you are a backslaughtering heart. I want you to notice a few things about this man that God sent Saul to protect him from the flesh. Number one, God sent him a man that could spot the flesh when he saw it. The Bible says, you know the story how Saul goes down there to kill the Amalekites. But he decided to keep a few things. He decided to keep Agag, the king of Amalek. The Bible says they went down and they utterly destroyed everybody, but they spared the best of the sheep. And they spared the good of the flock. And they spared the king. But you knew what they did, brother? They, they took him hostage. They took him captive. They detained him. They said, Saul, he came in. And Saul comes back from Amalek. And he comes back and the preacher meets him and says, he says, hey, preacher. He said, yes, sir, I, I did what you preached on the other night at that camp meeting. Yes, sir, Sam, you used to tell me what to do to the flesh and I did it. Oh, yeah, I took care of the flesh. And notice what Samuel said. He said, is that right? He said, what about those sheep? And those oxen. Let me ask you a question. How does Samuel know whose sheep and whose oxen that was? How did he know? 
know it wasn't some of the Jews' sheep? How did he know that wasn't some of the Jews' oxen? Because Samuel was a man of God that could spot the flesh when he saw it. I'm going to tell you something, young person. You ought to thank God every day. He's given you a pastor that can spot the flesh. He can spot it when nobody else. Oh, they may think it's good. They may think it's spiritual. But your man of God gets up on the pulpit and cries out against it. And you're sitting there thinking, what's he talking about? Thank God for a man of God that can spot the flesh when he sees it. He may cry out against it when he sees it. I'm going to tell you something, when God sends you a Samuel, amen, he can detect the flesh when he sees it. I'm a little bit worried about how much flesh has crept into our churches. I'm not talking about the Methodist church. I'm not talking about the Presbyterian church. I'm talking about our independent Baptist, fundamental Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches. And we claim to be the cream of the crop. There's so much flesh under this tabernacle tonight. There's so much flesh in our churches tonight. And if we'd be honest, God, give us some men that'll spot the flesh and cry out against it. I'm a little bit bothered, Brother Phil Beck. I'm a little bit bothered at this younger generation in our churches that wants to be cool. Am I all right, Brother Morgan? I'm a little bit bothered about this young crowd wants to come be popping in. By the way, let me go ahead and clear the air a little bit. I never understood why, why folks have to wear sunglasses when it's raining outside. For the life of me, brother, I don't understand it. Yeah. They're cool. Right. 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 I mean, the sun's not shining, but at least you look cool. Come on, brother. Where'd we get this garbage? I'm talking about in our churches. Turn your sunglasses around backwards and wearing them on the back of your neck. Can't you imagine Samuel coming out? Can't you imagine Samuel coming out with the sunglasses turning around backwards on his neck? These young boys coming in our churches, brother, looks like they stuck their head in the toilet and flushed it, sprayed some moose in and came to church. I'm a little bit bothered by the flesh all the Amalekite junk in our churches. We set our kids down in front of the Amalekite shows, set them in front of the television, let them watch all the little Amalekites, program them how to be good Amalekites. Flash, 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 flash. Feed the Amalekite in them. Don't kill it, just feed the Amalekite in them. Then we wonder why when they turn 12 and 13 years old, they're full of rebellion and the girls dress like harlots and the boys are ready to get out of the house. I'll tell you why, Daddy. It's because you set him in front of the latest Amalekite show. Listen, I wouldn't give a pinch of snuff in a whirlwind for some little sissy preacher that's there just to make you happy and pay. Amen, pepper you. But God give us some men of God who will stand up and cry out against my sin, cry out against my wife's sin, cry out against my kids' sin. We need Amalek to die. God sent Sam. Listen to him. God sent Saul. A man yes. that knew, amen, yeah. that knew the sign of the flesh. But God sent Sam, listen to me, God sent Saul a man who could distinguish the sound of the flesh. Yes, sir, preacher. Oh, yeah, we did everything that the Lord commanded. Yes, sir, boy, we took care of them old Malachites. And he was so accustomed 
to being around all the bah. Saul was so accustomed, he didn't even hear it. Oh, yeah, he's standing there lying to the preacher. I mean, standing there looking around. Yes, sir, preacher. I appreciate you preaching against my sin, but I've been applying that stuff. The whole time he's lying to the preacher, the flesh is echoing all around him. God was trying to protect the man from the flesh. God sent him a message. God sent him a man. And God sent a man that could spot the flesh. He could detect the sound of the flesh. I could preach all night right there. God give us a generation of preachers that have enough spiritual discernment to know the flesh when you hear it. Well, tell you something, young person. When your pastor says you don't need to be listening to that, you should never say, well, what's wrong with it, preacher? I just just don't see anything wrong with it. You can't even determine the sound of the flesh. Tell you what, Samuel knew the flesh when he heard it. He knew the flesh when he saw it. Well, preacher, I don't see anything wrong with what I'm wearing. You know why? Because you're filled with your own ways. And God's put a man in your life to protect you from you. Listen, to me, he's not preaching against the way you dress to try to make your life miserable. He's preaching against what you, listen to me, the very thing you're doing is the reason you are miserable tonight. And the very thing God has put in your life will satisfy you from yourself if you will listen to God. But you'll never be satisfied listening to it. You'll never be satisfied wearing it. You'll never be satisfied going there, doing that. What's wrong with him? He's my boyfriend. He's a punk. That's what's wrong with him. He's a little Amalekite punk. And young lady, God's put a man of God in your life to protect you from him. He's flesh. He's flesh. God was protecting Saul from himself. And while I'm preaching tonight, God has his eye tuned towards you. Sir, listen to me tonight. Listen to this preacher. This was your last stop. This was your last roadblock God put in your life to keep you from destroying your marriage. Right. Ma'am, if you only knew what he's been looking at all week long on the internet, you know why he don't seem to be enjoying himself tonight. I'm going to tell you something, preachers. Come on, brother. God help us. Listen, brother, if there's ever been a generation of preachers who need to be crowned against pornography, I mean, brother, listen, you don't have to go down to the store to buy it. You don't have to go to a movie theater to see it. You don't, hey, man, brother, I'm telling you, just the cell phones on our sides and all the modern technology, we can feed Amalek anytime we want to. And the only way to keep from doing that, there must be a steady diet of Samuel said, kill it, put it to death, get rid of that. If it's on the flesh, stomp it out, destroy it. Only why a preacher preaches against all those things. Because they're, they're Amalekite things, that's why he's preaching against them. I could spend a long time, let me run. He could spot the flesh. He recognized the sight of it. He recognized the sound of it. He recognized the seriousness of it. In verse number 20, notice what the Bible says in verse number 20. Verse number 20, the Bible says, and Saul said to Samuel, yeah, he said, yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I've gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I've brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Look, Look in the next verse. But the people took the spoil, the sheep, 
and oxen and the chief of the things it should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal and Samuel said hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken by the way the context of these verses that we talk about rebellion being as a sin of witchcraft you know what it's pertaining to killing the flesh Samuel said, you don't understand the seriousness of this thing called the flesh. He said, you can't worship God with the flesh. You cannot give God flesh. Amen. Here's what's very interesting about this flesh. Notice something about this flesh. The Bible says in verse number 15, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared, notice this word, the best of the sheep. Does everybody see that? In verse number nine, back in verse number nine, it says Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good. Let me tell you something about the flesh. If the devil can't talk us into doing bad in the flesh, He'll convince us it's all right to do good in the flesh. Let me tell you something. God's attitude about the good of your flesh is the same as his attitude about the bad of your flesh. Worshiping God in the flesh is no different than adultery. It's still flesh. You may not be out getting drunk. You may be out not out be smoking dope. But oh, you've got a lot of flesh that you're trying to give to God. And God said, he's not receiving the flesh. I don't care how good it looks, how good it sounds, how much you pepper it up. It's still flesh. You know what they did? You know what, you know what Saul did? The Bible says he detained Agag. He said, but preacher, you don't understand. I got the flesh under control. I got him shackled down. I got the flesh where I can handle it now. I mean, I took care of everything that I saw that could destroy me, but now what little bit I got left, I've got it under control. Some of you drill gay gag into this camp meeting this week. You got him shackled down in your seat. You got him chained down real good and you think, boy, because you've got him chained down and you had not had any flare-ups in a few weeks, then you're good to go. Right. Right. Amen. Yeah. That's true. That's right. And I'm going to tell you something. You let him breathe and you let him live and you're going to find a day that Agag is going to come back to haunt you. God didn't say to detain him. God never said get your flesh under control. God said kill it. Crucify it. Mortify it. It don't matter if it's a little toddler, a Malachite. It doesn't matter if it's a little suckling, a Malachite. It doesn't matter how innocent, harmless it looks. The reason the preacher's preaching against it is because it's a Malachite. Not because it looks wicked and not because it looks evil and not because it looks dangerous, but he sees the danger down the road that it's going to cost you. He sees the problems it's going to cost your marriage. He sees what it's going to do to the church five or ten years down the road if Amalek is not dealt with tonight. Amen. Here's what Saul did. And this is what we did. He excused the flesh. In verses 13 through 15, here's what he told him. I haven't got time to read it. He said, preacher, we got rid of all the bad stuff. Yep. All that bad stuff, we got rid of it. And notice how spiritual Saul sounds in verse number 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, here's what he said. He said, preacher, he said, you ain't gonna believe this. Here's what he said. He said, blessed be thou the Lord. I sure am glad I got me a preacher like you that'll tell it like it is. Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed all that the Lord commanded me. Let me tell you something, the flesh is so hypocritical. We excuse it. Amen. 
Matter of fact, Saul, he went on to excuse it. Verse 15, he said, the people. He said, he said, the people kept the good and the best, but we utterly destroyed all the rest. He didn't take credit for the wrong. He took credit for the right. He didn't take credit for letting the, the Amalekites live. He took credit for the Amalekites that were killed. The flesh always tries to justify itself. The flesh always says they did it. He did it. She did it. The flesh never says I did it. But notice Saul not only tried to make excuses as to who did it, but he also made excuses as to why they did it. Well, preacher, you don't understand. The reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because I'm trying to be a blessing to somebody. The reason I'm missing church on Wednesday night works is because I'm trying to help the church out financially. I'm trying to give to God. Oh, preacher, you don't understand. The reason we're kind of courting is because I think I can help him spiritually. Oh yeah, I believe I can help her. Preacher, I know she don't go to a church like we go to and everything, but she does say that she's saved. You talking about that same girl? That same girl that wants to be along with you? Amen. Young man? You talking about the same girl that's been making those eyes at you? Mama. Amen. And I'm not talking about innocent eyes. Flesh! Flesh! And I'm going to tell you something, the adults, we're about as bad as the, I'm going to tell you something, brother, I'm a little bit offended. I'm a little bit offended at how much overly friendliness there is between the opposite sexes in our churches. That is the prelude to adultery. I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna tell you something, ma'am. You don't have any business just striking up conversation with other men in the church. Sam. Listen, I'm not talking about being rude. I'm talking about protecting you from Amalek. It is unhealthy. It is, I'm not talking about hugging. Uh, I'm talking about just, uh, hey man. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, that's not even a question. That's wrong. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Amen. I'm talking about those elongated handshakes. And you're trying to pull your hand away. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Let me tell you something, ma'am. Men don't have female friends except his wife. You're welcome. Do we have ladies in our church? Yes, sir, but they're not my buddies. saying we're getting in trouble with the flesh because we're not spotting Amalek most adultery could be killed before it ever got off the ground if we would have killed it when it was an infant and a suckling amen Ma'am, listen to me. If you still want your husband five years from now, I hope you'll hear what this preacher's saying tonight. Yeah. 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 He has no business being friends with your friends. I don't know if this is camp meeting preaching or not, but brother, this is where we are and this is where we live. And brother, we've got a problem whether we want to admit it or not. And I'm gonna tell you something, brother, if killing Amalek kills a camp meeting, we must have had nothing but Amalek to start with. But if we have a heart to 
to please God. We want to kill everything that would kill us. You know what I love about the holiness of God? God hates everything in my life that would ruin my marriage. God hates everything in my life that would wreck my ministry. God hates everything in my life that would break my kids' hearts because those things of the flesh, those things we let slide, We excuse it. Right. Amen. Saul don't excuse it. I'm about done preaching. I think I've got five minutes. Saul don't excuse it. He exaggerated it. If you don't believe it, I want you to see what he did. The Bible says in verse number 12, when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel saying, Saul, came to Carmel. Yeah. And he may be here tonight. And God gave me this message. I preached it at our church on a Wednesday night, but God birthed it in my heart for this meeting. Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen. Lord. That's Amen. right. Thank you, God. Because God said Saul came to Carmel. Right. 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 Yep. And the Bible says, and behold, he set him up a place. And has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. He's already come to Carmel and he's gone. But here's what he did. The Bible says, Brother Morgan, he set him up a place. Some of you preachers may know this. If you study that out, let me tell you what that means. That means he erected a memorial of victory when he came back from Amalek. He came back to Carmel and he built a memorial of victory. He set him up a memorial so everybody could see the victory that Saul has over the Amalekites. Let you, sir. I'm talking about the exaggeration of the flesh. Oh, yes, sir, preacher. <laughs> I got victory over that thing. Do you really have victory over that thing? You've been shouting, you've been running, acting like you've got victory, knowing all along. Knowing all along, you've got a gag all chained up at your house. Knowing all along. You've been dragging him around with you while your wife wasn't around. Amen. Look up here, young man. Does your mom and daddy think you got victory? Have you convinced them that you're walking in victory and you know in your heart you're not? You come to a meeting like this and wave your Bible in the air and you shout and claim to be right with God. No one! That Amalek's still alive. I'm going to close with this. He excused it. He exaggerated it. But that's not what God said to do with it. Notice what God said we're to do with the flesh. God says we're to execute it. Now watch this. We don't excuse the flesh. We don't exaggerate it and pretend like we've got victory. It will come back to haunt us. It came back to haunt Saul. But I want you to notice what God said we're to do with it. Look in verse number 32. The Bible says, Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag says, Surely the better of death is past and Samuel said as thy sword hath made women childless so shall thy mother be childless among women and Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal let me tell you what just happened right there for those of you that don't understand what Samuel just did amen the preacher came and said go get Agag he says so I know you're saying you're walking in victory and I know you said you've got victory but I hear the sheep and I hear the oxen and I see all Agag. It may like look like you 
you got a gang whipped down and you got him under control. But let me tell you, that's not how you deal with a gang. You don't chain him up. You don't chain him down. You don't try to restrict him. He said, I'll tell you what you do. Bring him out here. Let the preacher show you what you do with him. They drug Agag out there all chained up. And here's what Samuel did. Samuel walked up to Agag, pulled Agag's sword out of his sheath. He said, you see this sword? It's made of many a mother's childless. He said, this day, this same sword is going to make your mama childless. What's this all? Here's how you deal with the flesh. You don't deal with the flesh chaining it up. You don't deal with the flesh trying to do better and get it under control. He said, you hit it and chop it into pieces. And the preacher cut loose. I mean, he blew everything out with the sword. He cut it into pieces, Brother Steve. I'm talking about guts was going this way, blood was going that way, his head rolled out that way, his leg rolled out that way. He got over there on his leg and started chopping it up. He got over there on his hand, started chopping it up, poked his eyeballs out, stabbed him through, cut him into pieces. When the preacher got done with the flesh, there's blood and guts everywhere. I don't like all that blood and guts preaching. Samuel did. Yeah. I just don't think that you can go to church and get exhorted and edified like you need to when that preacher is always slinging blood and guts. Now the problem is you've never been satisfied from yourself. I wish I had time to preach it. I'm out of time. I'm done preaching. But here's what Samuel said. If you look at the last verse of the chapter, will not you look at the very last verse of the chapter? The Bible said, in the very last verse of the chapter, and Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. He left him. Listen to me. The preacher left him to himself. Is that what you want tonight, sir? You want the preacher to leave you to yourself. Young lady, look up here at the preacher. Do you want me to leave you to yourself? You want your pastor to leave you to yourself? I wish mom and dad would leave me alone. You want them to leave you alone? What you're saying is you want God to leave you alone because God put your parents there to protect you from you. said God put your parents. God put the preacher. God put the message there to protect you Amen. from you. And the very thing that you're upset about is the fact that you're not getting your own way. But if you could ever reach the point that you understood that you will never be satisfied as long as Amalek's are breathing as long as those little sucklings still have breath. Some of you don't understand why you don't have joy. You don't understand why you come to a meeting and everybody around you is getting blessed and you're trying to fake it. You got to fake it! You know why? Because you're not satisfied like they are. Because there's a little... Baby Amalekite still breathing. And until you stifle out every breath it has, Amen. until you choke it down until it dies, right. until you cut it up and hew it into pieces. Yes, God, help. Right. Amen. Uh -huh. That's right. Make not provision for the flesh. To fulfill the lust thereof. Amen. Right. Well, preacher, I know I've been struggling with it. And I know the preacher said I need to get rid of it, but I got in victory of it, and I don't really, I don't really struggle with it like I do anymore. You still got Facebook, sir? No. Come on. Amen. I'm telling you something, preachers, listen. 
You do what you want to do, brother. I've got a cell phone, but I refuse to have internet on my cell phone without an accountability program on it. Listen, look at me. You know why? I don't trust me. I've got covenant eyes on my phone. I can't, I can't get apps. I can't do anything. I can't go online. I can't, and I'm not making it about me. Every man in our church is supposed to have it. Bless God. Let me tell you something, ma'am. If your husband still hadn't got it since he's heard it from the pulpit, there's a reason why he don't want yeah. it. Amen. My wife can at any time see anywhere I've been on the internet. She knows, amen. She gets alerts on her phone. I can see where she goes on the internet. I know where she's been on her phone. She knows everywhere I've been on my phone or her home computer. I'm talking about dealing with Amalek, killing any lifeline to Amalek. Killing a lifeline to Amalek. Because if it could still breathe, it might come back to haunt me. Preacher, I'm done. 